Uh, so today the theme uh, for topic for today's workshop is uh, uh, collab basically collaboration, team teaching and team development uh, of, uh, of curriculum resources, of courses uh, more generally. And our presenter is uh, Yuta Trevranis, one of our team members of the MMC uh, Mixed Media Collaborative. So uh, Yuta, I guess without further ado, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks Al. And um, I'm less the presenter. I'm, I'm hoping that this will be a collective discussion regarding the resources that you've all tried with respect to collaborative tools or, or strategies to allow for collaboration. And I've um, also invited a guest, uh, Sandra Danilovic, who has a great deal of experience with uh, one of the tools that we'd like to highlight. So I, I'm going to share, I think I'm going to share my entire screen, which I know is kind of dangerous um, when, um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to bounce between PowerPoint and uh, a number of links that I want to show you. And so for that reason, uh, I, I'll uh, have more than one application up. So I'll show you the screen. Um, and can you tell me what you see? A plethora of tools. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> right, that is that was part of the screen. Okay, so um, as Al was saying, uh, today I'm going to talk about collaborative teaching, or I've also called it "You Are Not Alone." I mean, as a faculty member um, and as everyone here that is uh, tasked with moving your um, teaching online and accomplishing the same things that were already almost impossible uh, through an online system um, with very, very little time for preparation and using a whole set of new tools, it can be hugely overwhelming. And um, one, one of the things that we want to talk about today is just how collaboration can make it a lot easier. And um, as those of you that have attended this workshop before know that uh, we are looking at or we're highlighting and prioritizing um, open systems and open publishing and um, shareable resources uh, for the reason that it, it makes it possible to uh, work together on things, to share things, to sort of share the load of moving online as well. And so um, what I'd like, we'd like to do um, in this hour or so is to, to give you a, a, just a taster of uh, what is possible and what other people have found useful um, with respect to collaboration. And of course, collaboration is a huge term. There's so many, as, as Al sort of mentioned right at the beginning, there are so many ways to collaborate. And um, the it, collaboration in the this context can be applied to authoring teaching resources with other educators. So creating online content with other educators so that you don't have to create all of the content on your own. And when things are online, and especially when they're openly licensed, it's very easy to... I thought he just went in there. Maybe it was you. If you see him, my laptop. Hi okay, there. Um, okay, he was just there. Okay. So, all right. Okay. Okay, so um, we're not going to mute you, but if people could mute while they're, um, when they're not talking, we're hoping that you'll also contribute. So um, that would be great. Or we'll be hearing all your conversations and they'll be recorded. <laughs> um, so the, the, the forms of collaboration that are possible is authoring um, teaching resources with other educators. And what you'll find is, especially within an education system, there may be many other faculty members who are teaching the same topics or um, 
slightly different topics, but with some of the content that's similar. And uh, there's the opportunity to band together and um, not necessarily team teach, but at least prepare the online, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, or the activities, the curriculum um, or the resources, or even the, the rubrics that you're going to use for assessment together. And we'll cover tools that help with that. Um, there is also um, a, a rising practice, which is collaborative authorship with your students. Um, and uh, the Open Textbook Network uh, has some great examples. And actually, I'm going to go in presenter mode or pr presentation mode so that, so um, I'm, I'll bring up one uh, really interesting um, guide that has been used uh, to making open textbooks with students. And here um, the, the guide includes quite a number of case studies that show how faculty have worked together and organized um, creating a textbook with students. And this, this also um, helps in what we talked about in terms of authentic assignments. So there's a move away from what, what are called disposable assignments, those assignments that only the faculty member and perhaps the student um, actually view and that th then are um, of no use afterwards. And at a time when students are feeling somewhat disengaged and disconnected from learning, uh, having something authentic that will actually contribute beyond uh, the studies is is even more critical and important. And so um, when a student is learning at the same time as they're producing some uh, a learning uh, product that is, is going to have a useful life, then uh, that tends to engage students more than if it's simply an assignment that is going to end up in the recycling bin. Um, the other uh, forms of collaboration include um, engaging students in peer assessment. So one of the things that is, I, I know that our university and quite a number of other universities have decided that going online is an opportunity to increase the size of the classes. And uh, the idea of peer, of assessing and grading um, an even increased number of assignments is, is somewhat daunting. And so there are um, collaborative methods to make that easier as well and tools to help in peer assessment. This means engaging students as peer assessors of their um, the other individuals in the class. And it's a, it's a great way to um, also introduce students to things like peer review and how to give constructive critique and how to be, to critically think about uh, various topics, not just the topics or the output of their fellow students, but also other uh, areas. And um, in, on this topic, there are quite a number of um, peer assessment tools that have been created that structure it so that it, it um, can be, um, it can actually provide a greater quality of assessment because you have more individuals that are providing feedback and constructive review of the output of the students. Um, and uh, all of these links I'm going to be sharing with people. Um, and many of these tools are open source so that and free. Um, and there are communities that are. Uh, researching the efficacy of the peer assessment and and what works and what doesn't work with respect to peer assessment. One of the things that they found is that peer assessors are actually much harder on each other and on themselves than uh, frequently faculty are and they are um, able to find uh, uh, weaknesses and make recommendations at a greater volume um, because they themselves are also, and many of the tools, um, assess the, the peer assessors on their assessment. So it's, it's a somewhat of a reflexive uh, and um, supportive system that we're talking about. One um, 
particular resource that I would draw your attention to is uh, the online peer assessment software by Nathan Clark and Paul Dowland. And they've been researching uh, the efficacy of peer assessment. And the other one is iPeer, which comes from Canada, Al, <laughs> from the University of British Columbia, uh, which is uh, another tool that, that people have found really easy to use and allows for um, a simple structuring of what students should assess each other on. Um, the other form of um, collaboration is supporting group work and collaborative assignments online. So here we're talking about uh, collaboration between students and engaging students. And this frequently helps in uh, reducing the, oops, oh, sorry. That was strange. Reducing the isolation that students feel and adding that social component that uh, will be absent if everything is done online. Um, and there are, uh, and I'll show in after Sandra talks about Twine, um, other tools that can be used within the classroom to support students working together on a, a number of project or, or problem-based learning assignments. Um, there are also, um, in the spirit of collaboration, there are curating tools and strategies, and there are these networks and communities that have sprung up that um, are pulling together what are all of the, the um, tools and strategies for uh, collaboration collaboratively. Um, and this, uh, I'll, oops. Uh, this is um, one such uh, collection that is curated and reviewed um, by the um, University of Massachusetts Amherst, where they have collected assessment tools, community tools, knowledge tools, and uh, learner-centered tools. And for each of them, they are um, uh, they are also collecting. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, information um, and reviews of the various tools, and they, here they include both uh, open source and commercial tools that everyone already uses. Um, the the last way that educators are collaborating quite extensively is by sharing insights. And um, one of the things that you'll find is that there's some very, very generous uh, faculty members that are experienced in teaching online that are pulling together all of their insights and, and uh, sharing them in a whole variety of different ways. Um, uh, this is one example that is quite extensive, um, this, oh, and I put on the last slide, but um, again, these will be, uh, I'll provide these links. So uh, the, these are facu other faculty members that have pulled together all of their insights and a list of uh, the, the types of tools that can be used for different forms of instruction and different media. Um, many of these are links to uh, tutorials, but also in uh, articles that review these tools or that give examples of how um, the faculty members have used them to in their classroom and in their their instruction. Those look like great resources. <laughs> and the, this is just a tiny taster. There are so many, and it and it keeps uh, updating all the time. I, I think the 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 one thing that um, people will probably find is how do you how do you pick the one to to uh, use and how do you um, filter through all of the the various systems and uh, tools that are uh, available to people um, and I, I think that for that reason it, it's great to be part of a network of faculty members and people who have already tried it because it is quite an investment to learn a new tool and it is uh, 
uh, often the types of instructions or the types of, of guidance that's given when you delve into it um, are, are not fully complete. So having a network of teachers that have some experience with the tools that you're going to be using is is a good thing to do. So I, I think this particular collaborative, and I, I think we, we could call this workshop, the MMC, um, a collaborative as well, is uh, probably a valuable way to, to share um, insights and what has worked and what hasn't worked. So I'm going to, um, what we wanted to do as well and what was requested is that we actually delve very practically into uh, showing some of these and demonstrating some of the tools that are available. And for that reason, I've invited um, Sandra to talk about one tool that uh, has um, been applied extensively in um, uh, addressing many of the goals, but also some of the, the issues that were brought up last week and the week before. So. Um, Sandra is, well, Sandra can introduce herself, but she's a, a wonderful uh, workshop leader and a faculty member at Wilfrid Laurier. And uh, her, her uh, primary topic is games and game jams and uh, engaging and students um, in and other individuals in um, these t with these tools. So I'm going to pass it on to Sandra. I'm going to stop sharing. and pass it to you, Sandra. <laughs> Thanks, Yuta. Um, it's wonderful to meet all of you and uh, uh, be part of this uh, talk. Um, so yeah, I have, you know what, I can actually go through some slides as well and maybe I'll share my screen so that you have a better sense of um, what I mean by twine and um, I will try and put it in context for you. Um, I teach game design and development at Laurier uh, here in, in Ontario, in Brantford, Ontario. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I'm always looking, my background is in the fine arts and design. I was a filmmaker for a very long time. So I'm always looking for ways to teach art practice to students, um, design practice to students. Um, in ways that can be uh, empowering and um, insightful and uh, 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 bring all kinds of benefits um, for both self and, and society and be transformative um, because art can ultimately be a very transformative uh, practice. Um, so let me just try and share my screen. Hold on a second here. Uh, share screen, desktop. Okay, uh, can you see uh, my, my slides? Yes, yep. Yep. we can see them. Okay, so um, Twine is essentially a, um, a tool uh, for designing a software, for designing text-based uh, games and so-called interactive narrative and interactive fiction. And one of the reasons why I love Twine and that is a, 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 a tool that is loved by many designers is because it's a tool that is incredibly accessible uh, to a lot of different people. Uh, people who are not necessarily professional designers, uh, people who uh, potentially want to learn more about uh, game design and, um, you know, start, uh, uh, start working in game design. It's a great introductory tool to game design and development, which as a whole can be very complex and can involve a set of highly sophisticated skills. And um, I want to give a little bit of context um, uh, to Twine. Twine was invented about 10 years ago by Chris Klimas, who is a uh, software developer from Baltimore. And it took off 
in games culture as soon as it was um, released. And one of the reasons that it, it was adopted widely by a lot of um, non-designers, but also artists and hobbyists and amateurs um, is because games culture tends to be a kind of very, um, uh, when we define games and we, when we define games culture in the games industry, both seems, seem to have very kind of narrow, um, they, they, they exhibit very narrow properties. So what I mean by that is that oftentimes a game is, um, has this very narrow definition uh, as popularly conceived. So oftentimes a game is defined as a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict, so a fictional conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. And so that's a very narrow, narrow definition of a game. Now, the second thing that, that also has a very narrow um, set of properties is, uh, is generally speaking games culture and games industry. And oftentimes when we think about video games, we think of these big budget first person shooters, oftentimes combat centric, reward focused, win lose, that have these trope characters and stories. And so Twine came along and, you know, uh, completely redefined the definition of games, but also um, was a force in diversifying um, the independent game scene and has been a force in diversifying the games industry as a whole, I think. I think it's had a revolutionary momentous effect in the past 10 years. And so this is kind of a slide that shows, you know, from a, a, a game scholar, again, who argues that games, uh, argues very narrowly for games. And as you can see, the hypertext fiction, which I'm gonna be talking about, and the interactive storytelling tends to be, uh, tend to be defined as not games, which I actually disagree with because there's a lot of many different ways to gamify your fiction and your, your stories. So it's, um, so the Twine Revolution came around and uh, it really sort of, uh, um, uh, it, it broadened the game design vocabulary as we, as we know it. And one of the first games to, to uh, come out um, at the, uh, about 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, that had a really um, significant effect on the games industry and the game scene and on kind of critical conversations around games and the games industry, um, which, which tends to be, as, as we know, as the games industry, it tends to be a very kind of monolithic industry oftentimes. So it's usually male dominated, not a lot of women, not a lot of uh, minorities, not a lot of kind of di diverse voices. And so this is, a, you know, the twine has been a kind of catalyst to, to um, uh, uh, enrich uh, uh, the, the, the games industry and games culture in general. And one of the first games that came out at the time, which, which was very influential, was a game by the name of Depression Quest, which is a twine text-based narrative. And the game is about the, the author's experiences with depression. Uh, it is a mental health game, which is my area of expertise. As a scholar, I study this particular genre of, of games. And I study makers who make, make games about their personal experiences with mental health and trauma and disability. And um, so uh, one of the ways in which Twine has been harnessed for the past 10 years is as um, to usher in a variety of different genres that artists and designers can uh, mobilize for their own either personal purposes or potentially uh, social uh, purposes and political purposes. Um, 
you know, the genres that have come out of Twine, of course, um, choose your own adventure games. That's a kind of a well-known genre that's existed before Twine, but also certain kinds of twists on other media modes of expression, such as electronic poetry. You can create poems with Twine, interactive poems. You can also create um, autobiographical games. It's in fact, Twine has been uh, an influential a tool for the emergence of personal and autobiographical games in games culture. Uh, uh, the emergence of the <laughs> interactive illness and trauma narrative, um, experimental games and art games, game diaries, if you want to call them. And, uh, you know, I list there the interactive therapist. You know, a lot of artists like to experiment with with uh, twine in all kinds of interesting ways. And Sandra, if I can interject, there's also twine used for math problems, twine used for chemistry experiments, twine used for a, a whole variety of things because of its, it, the interactive na nature. Oh, thank you, Yuta, absolutely. I've actually used twine as a, instead of PowerPoint. So instead of PowerPoint, I sometimes will use Twine as a format for presenting. Um, you can use it so versatile. You can use it for many different uh, for many different purposes. Um, it it does. It is HTML based. So the output of a Twine game is as an HTML file uh, as a web. It's a web based form of game design. Um, so it's very versatile in that way. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the, uh, another influencer in terms of the twine genre is a game designer by the, by the name of Anna Anthropy, uh, who, by the way, wrote a book, uh, which I use in all my classes called The Video Game Zinsters. Uh, she's a, a, a designer who has championed twine as a way to experiment and play with the, the, the games and game design. Uh, and um, have a lot of fun with it and, you know, uh, subvert some of those usual kind of uh, avenues that we are and subvert some of those usual kind of conceptions of what it means to, to play a game. Um, and there's an, a, a, a huge number of twine games out there that, that you can play that are free. They're, they are open source. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, a Twine is accessible is because it is, for example, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript based. So in that sense, if you want to teach how to make games, one of the best ways to start making games is by starting with HTML markup language. It's just really easy. It's, it's, uh, 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 it's a really great introductory language for web design. That's used in web design, obviously, but for, for game design. And with Twine, you can um, actually work with all kinds of dynamic user inputs and outputs. So for example, you can customize games the game, the text-based game. So every time a, a player plays a Twine game, they can play as themselves. So the game will address their, them in their own name and in their own pronouns. For, so it's, it's like, uh, it, you know, whatever input you, you um, uh, kind of input into the game, that's what they, the game will integrate into the story. So there's all kinds of ways that you can, um, you know, make a statement with Twine. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of things. I'm just going to say I'm, another thing which you, which you can do, which I think is really powerful, is you can harness a variety of narrative structures to construct an, a story. Uh, and oftentimes, Twine text-based narrative, Twine text-based games are not linear. They are non-linear. They, um, uh, 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 you know, can provide for ways in which to experiment with, with narrative. And so you can use any number of 
narrative structures entwined, such as a branching narrative structure. This is an example of a branching narrative structure, a fishbone narrative structure, a parallel narrative structure, a concentric narrative structure, and a threaded narrative structure. So, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of ways to experiment with narrative and storytelling using twine uh, and work with variable outcomes and uh, multiple player choices, variable player choices, um, so that you can give the player agency, uh, more agency as opposed to just, uh, for example, reading a book or engaging with, a, uh, you know, watching a movie where you don't have um, you cannot impact the, 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 the outcome of a narrative. Well, in this case, in the case of twine and interactive narrative, you can, you can have an active role in shaping that narrative and the outcome of that narrative. Um, so yes, that's in a nutshell, uh, twine. It's a wonderful tool, a uh, very accessible, it's got its flaws and problems, but Comparative to other tools, it is uh, one of the most accessible tools, in my opinion, for, for designing games and um, for learning how to make games as well. Do, do you purchase it or do you, do you download it off the internet? Let me just show you one second here. Uh, it's completely open source and free. One second. Uh, let me just, uh, yeah, you can still see my screen. This is the book I was telling you about which is fabulous. Again, I mean, it's been a great tool of social justice for a lot of people. Twine is oftentimes used harness by marginalized communities, marginalized makers, excluded groups, uh, whether it's, you know, kind of uh, economically or otherwise. And twinery.org is the website where you go to twinery.org and essentially all you do, Twine is an open source tool for telling interactive nonlinear stories. It's completely free. You can download it. It's available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So it's multi-platform, or you can use it online. So let me show you. I click on it. You can literally use it online and it's very well, um, there's a tutorial for how to use it. There are multiple tutorials and videos on YouTube on how to use Twine. And, um, you know, if I click here on tell me more, then it's going to lead me into the tutorial. But I just want to show you here, if I just do skip, all that, you, that is required is to just click on this button here that says story. And you can name the story. Um, our story, whatever uh, title you would like. And it creates um, a particular project. And then all you do is you um, literally start working on it. And this could be the start page, right? And all you do is there's a, a, a particular syntax that's very easy to learn to, to, uh, to employ in order to create these interactive stories. And one of the main ways to create a link, for example, is by using double brackets, I think, unless they've changed it. So I can, for example, uh, create a number of pages here, and then it will lead me to, um, you know, various names. Now I'm just like putting in any name here. Uh, okay, now if I close that, it's gonna save it. And literally, there it is, that's the first page. And then if I click on those names, it's gonna lead me to different pages where I can keep, where I can actually write a narrative. I can write a whole story here and make it interactive and immersive. And it's this simple. And then you use a particular syntax in order to uh, create that story. Um, and then the other thing you can do is um, you can play it and test it right away. 
you can change the color, the CSS, the cascading style sheets, the look and the style of um, the story. Uh, you can put in images and graphics. You can embed videos and other links. You can pretty much do anything that a website can do. And you can also do a lot of things that a game can do. So you can have a score, you can tally results, you can have a counter, you can work with more mathematical features to quantify the narrative, to mathematize it, to, to you know, you can work with variables uh, uh, and, and so forth. So you can actually work with a lot of computers, like computer uh, uh, design, computer science uh, principles. Um, and, and you can learn programming, of course, which is in fact, is you are in, in, in effect programming when you're, when you're working with Twine. So that's it in a nutshell. So for example, you know, if I play it, there it is, I, sorry, that's my mistake. I, sh I think I put in three, I can go back and correct it. Then when I click on those, uh, you know, it just takes me to the page. And then there's all kinds of possibilities to do a lot of different things, experiment with, with um, words. And, uh, you know, you can work with randomness and so-called procedural content generation. So in other words, if you click on a page, it will randomly generate some a particular phrase uh, and so forth. And it's quite easy to do. Now, of course, there's more difficult features, but you can build up. You can slowly, the more you utilize it and the more you uh, practice with it, you can build up your um, uh, programming skills. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Sandra. Hi. Can you show an example of how to use it in uh, teaching math? Thank you. Yeah, um, let me just, I would have to, okay, hold on a second. I would have to um, go to a particular game that has some of those properties. I actually have this, I just can't find it at the moment. I do have a file that um, where I can show you, uh, and there's actually quite a lot of videos. Let me just go to the videos first. Um, YouTube, um, working with variables, twine. So are, um, just to, uh, to clarify on the question, are you uh, asking teaching math using twine or in, um, including math in Twine as one of the variables for setting up the game? Uh, because he said earlier that I can use it like a PowerPoint. So in creating my, my, my lessons, maybe I can, can I use it? Actively? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I intend to, you know, if I can yeah. use it, why not? Yeah. And you can, so you can use it, you can collaborate with someone you, yes, you can start something and then have your students contribute to building it exactly. out. Exactly. Yes. Like if I'm working on an interactive note taking. Yeah. It's really, yeah, I do that with most of my students. And I think I, I don't see that going on with a PowerPoint very clearly. So you can, if, um, you can work with variables, conditionals, loops all kinds of all right program, I'll try. programming principles algebra algebra principles mathematical you know various kinds of you can work with counters and num and and you know quantify outcomes and things like that so and it's just a matter of um uh digging into it a little bit more uh, more and if, and if you're a math teacher you might have a really easy time to just kind of uh, and if you know some coding already, um, then that's, that will be very helpful, actually. Do, 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 you, know, do you know coding? Uh, can you code? I am really non-tech individual, but I, I learned all my technology stuff, 
like by myself i try to and also asking asking friends and that's why i'm asking now so if i can ask and i can figure out i put this together and voila i can try to use it in my teaching yeah and and you can play with it i mean the the yes there's no you know there's no loss or expense it's free and yeah. easy to move to fix things as well. And the other thing you'll find is that there are lots of twine libraries. So things that people have already created that you can then that are openly licensed, that you can reuse. So you can take someone's twine and add. Um, yeah, re you reuse it, exactly. repurpose it. Well, my goal is if I can interact with my students using this platform, it would be very nice because I know that my students would be able to follow what we're talking about in the same pace. And it is not easy to do that with a PowerPoint presentation or a Microsoft Word that they can do on their own. So I might as well try it. Thank you for sharing the right. um, yeah, yeah. The website. Well, you just try what, what you just said is really important. Actually, there's a lot of libraries of code as well, um, multiple libraries where you can actually, and forums where, where uh, uh, you, uh, you know, Twine users are more than welcome to give you the exact code for something if you're not familiar okay. with, it and help you with it. Yeah, thanks. I've got a question, uh, this is Al. Um, Twine looks like a really interesting tool and very, like you were saying, very uh, um, flexible. There's a lot of different ways you could use it, both with students working on projects and, and, and faculty creating learning materials. I'm wondering, say you're, you're, you mentioned social, I think social justice as one kind of a, a, a topic area or theme area where, uh, where, um, uh, uh, Twine has been used. If you're teaching a course in, say, social science, and you want students to create a Twine project, say, you know, DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, doing a story about it, um, that would help, you know, really bring out the issues. Is there a, how, how hard, how, how much of a heavy lift is it for students to get, you know, to get into the programming so they can actually start creating the content? Um, so, okay, great question. So, you know what, if you actually, it, you're right, it's such a versatile uh, platform. Let me just like get out of the, uh, one second, let me just get out of the screen share. Um, could someone, oh, okay, here we go, stop share, one second. Okay, there we go. Um, it's distracting here. Um, and and actually, know, I can, um, if you want, uh, Sandra, I can show, some of the work that's done by the Canadian version of the Indigenous Multimedia co uh, Collective, uh, specifically on social justice issues. Would that be helpful? Is, is, is that a twine game? Yeah, it's, the, it's twine. Great, great. Um, so I can, uh, one second, I'll share my screen. Um, what I was quickly going to say is that in terms of the skill level, you can actually just stick to links. That's it. All you do is you use double brackets to um, uh, create a narrative. And that's it. You don't even have to use some of the JavaScript, which is here I'm talking about programming. Programming. You don't actually even have to use the programming if you don't want to. You can just stick to telling a story, an interactive story, through the double brackets and, and building a narrative that way. Uh, you, you, so it's up to you. It's actually you have the choice to to make it as um, uh, 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 in, you know uh, as complicated as you you want to make it. Or uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if you just stick to links that it's not going to be complicated. Just you can mathematize it if you want to, and you don't. But you don't necessarily have to. Working with numbers and variables is a bit more difficult to wrap your brain around. You do need that mathematical brain a bit, and you do need a bit of practice. So, so speaking of links, um, how do we, once you go to the twinery.org, how do we share, or what link do we share with the students? 
Um, at the the twinery.org is definitely the link. Twinery.org. One second here. Twinery.org, I think. Uh, so that's um, that's the link to share. Uh, and then, um, I, I mean, you do need to, you do need to, because it's a software tool, right? You do need to give students a, a kind of introductory workshop on how to use some of its features. Uh, unless, of course, they're really comfortable uh, trying it out on their own and just using YouTube videos to, to learn on their own. But it's just like, it's just like Photoshop or any other software tool or, or Word, right? Like you, you still have to learn how to use some of its features. But it's, in my opinion, one of the most accessible game design tools that, that exist out there. There are others, of course, but, but this is one that's quite accessible. Right. So I've been, I've been just showing um, a little bit of the some of the tutorials that are available uh, as you delve further into this and I'll share this link. This is um, a Canadian group that has almost exactly the same goals that we have and they've been uh, using Twine to create interactive uh, curriculum. It, it all sorts of forms of interactive curriculum um, it, and these are examples of uh, different twinery uh, or twine uh, games that have been created, including things like uh, knowledge maps, um, equivalent of something like a PowerPoint, but that's interactive, which students can then explore. As you can see here, um, there are multiple tabs so that uh, you, you're creating a hyperlinked form of textbook that allows you to students to explore other than in a linear fashion. Um, creating actual uh, uh, audio uh, uh, lectures and interactive audio systems. Um, there's a, a, a video form where it is a, you choose the, the path type of video, et cetera. Um, and there's, a, as well as what are seen as more traditional games, um, these are uh, and uh, language instruction since we were talking about language instruction um, there are it's used quite a bit in introducing students to languages and allowing students to contribute so imagine beginning an instruction piece on a language but then asking students to come up with other words to add to it so it can grow um, and they can add, once you can provide a structure or you can allow students to add their structure and then capture uh, samples or uses of particular words or phrases um, or, or um, cultural phenomena. The, um, there are ways of capturing and uh, telling stories that are part of the community um, and then uh, uh, also um, ways of using games to uh, communicate different concepts and whether it's STEM concepts or artistic concepts. Uh, and uh, this, this particular link, which I'll um, show you, has tutorials and discussions about why you might want to use uh, twine etc but it's a it's a a great uh, resource that shares and and as sandra was saying digital poems um are other things that are being created there and apologies <laughs> go ahead sandra no i think it's a, that's a wonderful um deck of slides yuta that's a great deck of slides. I, yeah, no, absolutely. In terms of social justice, um, you know, Twine has, as I mentioned, Twine has been a huge artistic uh, intervention and uh, transformative tool in, in both games culture, uh, the games industry, 
uh, it's had a huge impact on diversifying voices in the games industry and giving a platform to uh, excluded communities and marginalized voices to be able to tell their own stories, um, to have the agency and autonomy to uh, tell their stories on their own terms as opposed to uh, other uh, kind of a bigger um, entities telling their stories. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a huge, I mean, I think it's had a significant effect on, on um, a social justice uh, 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 you know, frameworks to, as, you know, used as a method, as a tool uh, to, um, um, uh, for, to, to build community, uh, to um, build networks of designers, uh, supportive networks, and so forth. Great. Um, I'd, I'd love to take further questions as well. Um, and I want to, um, I, I, I noticed in the chat, um, someone commented that this is quite advanced for someone that's an online beginner. Um, I, I think uh, it, it can be complex, but it can be very simple. And uh, the, the tutorials are available to support people in just exploring and playing with it. Um, I, I wanted to also very quickly mention a few other collaborative tools, but I'd love to take questions before people have to leave as well. If you found those, that list of tutorials, I missed it. Did, did you have it to put on screen, please? Yeah, I will. Um, so the, there's a link. I don't know uh, when you arrive here. That I will repaste the link. Um, so this is, these are the set of tutorials from uh, British Columbia. Uh, but there are other tutorials as well. And on YouTube and Vimeo, there are a whole range of, of videos where people share how they created instructional materials using Twine and um, walk through step by step exactly how to, to do various things. I have a question. How different, yeah. how different is um, Twine from, um, say, setting up a PowerPoint? Um, a PowerPoint tends to be linear and it's harder to make it interactive and to collaborate in it, which is the beauty of Twine in that you, do, you don't have to have a linear narrative. So this, the, both what you produce and um, so uh, w one of the ways that I've used Twine in my class is um, I start with a uh, creating a Twine game, but then I give students different branches to then expand. So as Sandra there created Utah, Sandra, and I forget what the third one was, um, uh, each of those, um, because students can collaboratively work on things uh, that you could assign a group to uh, uh, expand that node and continue to create children of that node. And um, you can then tell them that they have to come back to the a central or a, a, a collaborative conclusion or uh, whatever. But uh, the activity that I use is the students do group, group work. They can then all explore the entire thing. So it becomes something that they can play back and they can explore. But they're also um, engaged in creating pieces of it. So I find it to be far better at uh, for uh, collaborative work and engaging the students in interactively. Does that make sense? Yeah, I used to teach web design. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was just, because um, this is more what you see is what you give, right? You type on it and you're not really looking into the background of scripts and, right. and HTML. And I think that's what kind of scares Yes. The way yeah. is when you start talking about HTML and, but if you just type it in straight up, straight forward, you know, you preview and you edit, when you're in edit mode, you're doing all the, what you see is what you get. Then when you hit preview, it shows up. Yeah. And the only, um, I was, I would have students um, not really 
read too much into the scripts if they didn't have to because once they went back into edit mode it would confuse them to see that these certain um, scripts would make the fonts turn yellow or green or blink you could make things blink or, or rain come down and all that kind of stuff but we kind of shied away from that and then they felt more relaxed without the talk of HTML and scripting because that sounds really um, hard to a, a non-technical person. Right, but it, but there's this this uh, uh, switch that sort of flips with non-technical people that uh, when they see the magic of scripts as well. But yeah, I agree. And of course, you can just create content that the students then explore. You don't have to engage the students in creating. Uh, the 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 content, but um, somebody asked um, to show. Actually, Sandra, do you want to show an example of something you've created in Twine, a ga game that you've created? Sure, sure. Um, hold on a second. Let me just go to uh, one second. Let me just. Uh... And a quick quick comment or question about the writing code or script. There, I think Sandra, you mentioned there's a whole library of 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 code of script for specific purposes in Twine. So you don't have to write a lot of new code. You just find what you need for what you need to have done and then you insert it into your Twine project. Exactly. Yeah, you do not need to be able to write code. You can, text is all that it requires. You actually can just go to your page source on MSN or whatever browser you're using and check their sources out and see how they're designing links and stuff because it's pretty, Absolutely. Across the, across the World Wide Web. Um, I just want to say, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You, uh, the way I, there's like several ways to teach Twine. And one of them, like to absolute beginners. And one of them is to just start with a very, very, very basics, which is just to create, a, for example, a branching narrative, which requires zero HTML or CSS or JavaScript. In other words, you don't touch the, the cascading, the look uh, or the color or the font. You don't touch anything. You don't touch the HTML. You don't touch the JavaScript. You literally are just creating a branching narrative with double brackets. That's all you need to know. One piece of syntax, mm -hmm. double brackets. That's it. We can all learn that. And all you do is in, you just write, just like you write on a piece of paper. You write and you use the double brackets to create a branching narrative. And you can literally play it as you go along and test it as you go along. That's it. Then once students get comfortable with that, then you introduce some of the more complicated concepts. But or as you get comfortable with it. <laughs> as an instructor, yeah. Right. <laughs> because I still have... Yeah. To learn it. Angelina. Yeah, sorry. I, I was saying you're right. I have to be comfortable using it before before I let my students, you know, uh, use it. And actually I wrote my question. You were men you mentioned earlier about coding and I was just about to ask, can I create my presentation using Twine without learning those codes? So I was like, I think you answered it already. Thank you. You can, you can. It's just that the only thing you can, if for example, you don't want to use the code, then you're going to have to just be happy with using white font, Arial, and black yeah. background. That's it. And equation editor, does it have an equation editor? Math. Yeah, so you can, there's, um, you can, there are libraries of equations that you can, and functions that you can paste in. Okay, thank you. And okay. um, Sandra, do you want to show a basic sure. one that you've created? Sure, just sure. Step through it? Hold on a sec, let me just share my screen. Uh, not share. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so this is a game. Actually, this is a presentation I created, a conference presentation I created in the form of a game about five years ago. And what I, the inspiration for it is I created it in Twine. And the inspiration for it was Craigslist missed connections. 
And essentially it's just literally, I mean, you're clicking, you know, and uh, you know, there's uh, the website asks you for a password and the password is love because it's a game about unrequited love. And then you are inside and then you can actually play the, play the game, which is essentially, I mean, it's a kind of a documentary game that's rooted in misconnections posts. Um, and then you can just click on some of these. Okay, these are not clickable for some reason. I'm not sure why, oh, there we go. Um, and it just keeps going um, and going, right? And, um, and there's all kinds of little tricks that you click on and you have to, you know, be willing to explore a little bit the interface. And these, uh, a lot of the, uh, these actually, what, what you see, the text that you see in the game are actual texts from Craigslist Misconnection, which is a public site. So, um, you know, they're, they're someone else's writing. Uh, and, you know, you click and the narrative just unravels essentially, right? Um, and there's a narrative there. And so that's, I used to, I use that for a, as a presentation to talk about autobiographical game design, essentially. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but of course you have to, I mean, as you can see, I was uh, authoring the, uh, I was scripting the, the CSS, the cascading style sheets, the color of the font, the clicks, the, um, when you hover your text, you can see when I hover my text, uh, it's, it's, it's pink or whatever. And, uh, uh, when I hover over the text, it's, it's pink. So that's all in the, uh, it's, it's in the script. It's in the source code. Those decisions are all in the source code. So I made it, I mean, there's quite a, a few complicated, there's a bit of complicated code for beginners in this particular instance, but, uh, you can, Again, as I said, um, there's, you can just stay at a certain level until you start to become comfortable with it. If you're, if you're keen on exploring some of these principles and, and you know, for yourself and uh, for your students. And I'll take you to a library of other examples as well that are um, a part of a, a, a consortium of Twine Education. Um, one second, so if you, if you unshare. Yeah, um, and actually just wanted to quickly point out to everyone that on the twinery.org website, uh, if you scroll down, uh, you can actually uh, click on hundreds of twine games uh, that are being authored every day. Uh, and so they have a Twitter account and so they, ha they have actually this, this website is not only the tools is right here to download, but it actually is also a repository of Twine games and Twine uh, uh, interactive uh, narratives. So let me just stop sharing. Very cool. Okay, oh. and then, um, shoot, sorry. Too many windows open. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll show you the example of joint education. Have you ever incorporated, um, um, what do you call that now, um, animation? Oh, definitely. You can, so um, all of the different media types are possible. Anything that is done in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So that, that allows you to add animation. It allows you to add um, even, uh, I mean, certainly audio, video, et cetera. Um, and here are uh, a number of, so this is another link that we'll share, which there, there's a, a group that is specifically within the Twine Wiki looking at teaching examples or how to use um, Twine to teach different uh, topics and how to teach Twine and tutorials uh, for Twine. Um, 
and various uh, uh, instructional videos on teaching with twine. Um, I, I'm very, I'm going to very quickly just mention a few other things. Um, so we've talked about, and, but uh, before I do any other questions, before we um, talk about, or I mention several other collaborative tools. Okay, um, so the, the, um, other types of, one second, I'm going to just share a different, my PowerPoint again. Oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> Where's PowerPoint? Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, so the, the um, other types of, of tools that um, are of interest because people were talking about how do you keep students engaged? How do you um, make sure that that they're interested in the instruction online and they, they continue to uh, uh, participate in uh, the, the lessons, etc., uh, especially when they're online? Um, there are, uh, and I'll share these particular resources as well. There's something called Peer Studio, which is, uh, as I was saying, doing uh, peer assessment, but there, there's also a number of different collaborative games and collaborative tools um, to engage students in collaborative learning. Um, another genre that is uh, really interesting is creating story maps. And this allows you to do things like um, attach annotations and information to maps. And it, it's useful not just for geography, but for anything that is in some way grounded in place, um, history, uh, politics, uh, 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 different stories uh, related to, and, and people have been using um, story maps in a whole range of ways. So this is, these are authoring environments that allow you to um, create maps that are instructional on a, a variety of different topics. Um, and then the other, um, there's, if you look, uh, there are quite a number of, um, organizations and institutes that are beginning to collect resources to help faculty. And there are different ones popping up all the time. And one of the things that I'm hoping I can do, I'm gonna create a script on the wiki that is a, uh, a search tool that uh, provides an alert and gathers uh, these resources. Um, so if you see that popping up on the wiki, I'd. I'd love um, you to review it, and if you find things that are especially useful, um, then it would be good to tell that to the rest of the people that are using the wiki. Uh, uh, we don't really have time, but um, there are um, alternatives to things like uh, Slack, et cetera, which allow for uh, group chat. Uh, Matter Most is one that a lot of academics are using. Um, there are also uh, these large, large libraries of tools. So Sandstorm is one. It has more than 70 open source collaborative apps um, that allow you to do things like surveys and uh, polls and uh, create wiki pages, etc. And the nice thing here is that uh, they, they're, uh, they're curated and so um, faculty are reviewing them and, and saying what works and what doesn't. And then um, another form of engaging students and collaborating is through annotation tools. And Hypothesis is a wonderful web-based um, annotation tool. In fact, you can annotate with Hypothesis um, web pages um, and uh, you can share those annotations. You can, um, and this is a, a great way for students to explore a particular web-based topic, or mm -hmm. and uh, ask you questions, etc. 
and uh, provide annotation and comments and critique uh, regarding um, a, a shared document that you are, or a, a document that you are collectively reviewing. Great. And again, I, I'm going to upload these slides so you'll have all the links. Fantastic. I mean, so many resources out there. I had no idea. I guess that's why we have these workshops. So I'm very quickly browsing through the questions. So, Angelina, we, yes, we'll, we'll put that up on the wiki. Um, and are there other comments, questions, um, any contributions that people want to make that are uh, useful resources for collaborating? It does occur to me that we should use something like that wiki site as a vehicle for people to post experiences or recommendations uh, around all these different resources that we're inviting everybody to explore. Right. Uh, you know, kind of like we should be a learning community to to um, to play around with these resources and uh, and kind of adopt what really works uh, kind of collectively or not, maybe collectively is too strong a word. But at least yeah, and I think Moima, uh, Moima set up a resources uh, page that has links to the tools and the opportunity to comment. And uh, Moima, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I set it up. Let me just double check if I did the comment. I'm pretty sure there is the comment as well. Um, let me just see if I can. Um, it's right here. Um, yeah, tools and resources. And then um, we have the, the contact of whoever put it there. So if you have any questions about it, you can reach out. And then you have the tool name, the, the, the description of the resource and the, where you can get it, the source or the website. And on the side, we have helpful tips and reviews. So anybody can go and give uh, your ideas or add some, here some, some people put some videos, for example, or other suggestions on comments about other resources. So it's, it's really cool. If you can, I'll check there, it's on under, uh, it's on our, if you go to the IHEC home on the wiki and scroll down a little bit, it's under uh, tools and resources. So, and please add too, if you have any cool um, resource that you use and that it's very useful and you like using it for teaching or learning, please add to it, it would be awesome. And Angelina, you were saying you were having difficulty with the um, the wiki. Oh, maybe she's. I'm sorry. So I was trying to say that I am looking at WikiFluid with the collaborative things that are in there, but I'm trying to use one of them, and it's hard for me to do it. Sorry, I'm not really great at technology so uh, which one were you were you having I, didn't, I don't know but I tried like two or three of them and I'm still trying oh it that's good time. yeah <laughs> and um, Moema is available to help out if um, and that that's another part of the wiki is to uh, request time to spend with Moema to help oh, you thank you yeah I can thank help you register the uh, and make the login and everything so we can go over it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Yeah. And let me 
just Like I was talking about our module this week, which is collaboration and the example given in, in the conversation uh, was uh, uh, working on a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, working on a, sorry? On, on, the, on the assignment on for this week is a jigsaw assignment and one of the things that i included in my in my sharing of uh, i don't know what you call that one but in the conversation was uh, if i give a a uh, a template for students so that they will be able to like figure out what they're expected to have after their discussion and put everything up on a jig so can i create that on on the uh twine yeah yes definitely you can put a lesson plan with the assignments with um the uh the reading that they need etc all of that yeah and that's not easy to to do with with a powerpoint but okay i always use the matrix but if i can make it more you know encouraging for students to to interact with then that would be a plus on their learning great yes yeah and maybe we can um we can i can send you basic tutorials for twine and th they will go up I'll, I'll put links up on uh the wiki for that and perhaps there would be a group of people who would like to explore that and create something together yes and, um, on the fluid did you say on the fluid um i yeah it'll did it'll go up in the fluid? schedule for today for this week like we are posting all of the resources um each week in the on the fluid wiki uh, okay. on the day that the workshop is happening okay thank you okay so I, I, I think we're out of time, <laughs> but and a lot of people have to move to other meetings. Right, uh, right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much, Yuta and Sandra. F fantastic workshop. A lot of great materials there for us to explore. Um, and uh, so we'll have uh, next week, we'll have another uh, workshop at 3 o'clock uh, Eastern. Uh, we don't have the topic uh, identified yet, do we? Um, but we will well before then. Yeah, we have we have several requests, so I, I think we haven't picked um, or prioritized which of the the requests that we uh, that were asked for. Yes, very good. Again, thank you all very much. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.